Uh, well, welcome back to the Fab Group. This is week two where we discuss fatigue in particular. Um, you're watching the long and detailed version which goes into uh, a, a lot of explanation as to what causes fatigue, etc. Um, if you want, you could swap to the short and snappy video which just gives you the highlights, but I'd definitely recommend this long and detailed version. So in this session we're going to talk about fatigue and we're going to look at different strategies and coping mechanisms and then we're going to also look at mindfulness and relaxation because that's important too. Um, this video is quite long, it's uh, about an hour long and uh, you, it's going to be very unlikely that you can sit through and just watch it just straight through. I'd very much recommend that you take it in stages, that you pause it at times, get up, get a cup of tea, coffee. Um, and you also might want to get a pen and paper so that you can make notes uh, because it'll be difficult to remember everything at the end. So what is fatigue? Well, I think these two pictures sum up fatigue quite well. And I love the phrase, my get up and go, just got up and went. But the thing is, these animals here might just be tired and exhausted. All they need is a bit of a nap and they'll be back to normal again. And that's the key thing. When we talk about clinical fatigue, it's not the same as normal tiredness. It's not going to go away just with a good night's sleep or a long rest. People say that fatigue is a constant uh, sense of exhaustion. You're just completely out of energy and you find it difficult to do normal activities. You feel wiped out as if you've hit a brick wall. It's interesting that fatigue doesn't only affect your physical condition and inability to do activity, but it also affects the brain. People talk about having brain fog. They find it difficult to concentrate and difficult to get motivated. People also say that fatigue affects their mood and they can become quite irritable and depressed. So what causes fatigue? Well, for most people uh, watching this video, it will be their underlying respiratory disease. But there are lots of other causes of fatigue and you may easily have some other factor that's adding to your fatigue and it would be a real shame to miss something that was uh, definitely treatable. For example, somebody with a heart disease is also going to get fatigued and there will be different medicines for uh, a heart problem and if we don't know about the heart problem we're going to miss it. Similarly, uh, you might develop anemia uh, where the haemoglobin in the red cells is very low and you can't carry oxygen around the body. That again is going to result in fatigue. So I would suggest that if you've noticed a, a, a quite a rapid drop in your uh, worsening in your fatigue, a drop in your energy levels, then it really might be worthwhile just asking your GP or practice nurse, you know, could I be anemic? Uh, could I have additional heart disease? Um, another condition that um, causes fatigue is low thyroid hormone levels, uh, hypothyroidism. Um, and then it's very simple really, you just have a little bit of extra thyroxine medicine and uh, you know your energy levels go up again. Medicines can also uh, cause fatigue um, and particularly I would say antidepressants, antihistamines used for hay fever and such like, um, and medicines to treat heart disease such as beta blockers and medicines to treat uh, hypertension also are quite, quite commonly cause fatigue. Then lack of sleep and poor nutrition can also impact on fatigue. And then these last two are really quite surprising, really. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that lack of activity causes fatigue. So if you sit around just being a couch potato, not moving, you are likely to uh, develop quite severe fatigue. That's happened to me at airports before. You know, you sort of sit around all day uh, waiting for a delayed flight and you're just so exhausted both physically and mentally even though you've done nothing. Uh, and of course, your mental mood, if you're having rather negative thoughts or feelings, then that can also uh, compound and exaggerate fatigue. 
I'd like to tell you about the energy token illustration, which is really very helpful when we're thinking about fatigue. Most people have as many energy tokens as they want to get through the day. There's really a limitless supply for most people who are fit and uh, healthy. But for people with an ongoing chronic condition, their energy tokens are limited. This doesn't just include people with lung disease, it's people with heart disease and uh, people with rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or lupus. Um, these groups of people are all going to find that the energy that they have to spend during the day is limited. And we often talk about people having about sort of 10 energy tokens per day. And any activity that you do throughout the day is going to use up these tokens. So just getting out of bed, getting washed and dressed and going downstairs is going to use up these energy tokens. So have a think for a minute. What do you do in the, in the morning as a matter of routine that is going to use up energy tokens? How many energy tokens do you think you'd have left uh, by, by lunchtime? How many would you have used up just doing routine stuff? Well, when we've asked people in fab groups before, they've often said that they've sort of used up about sort of five energy tokens by lunchtime, um, getting washed, getting dressed, having breakfast, etc. Uh, but the key thing to note is that if you have developed uncontrolled, gasping, severe breathlessness doing any of these activities, then you'll have automatically used up another three tokens, just like that. Um, so you might find by lunchtime, if you've done something like if you've got a really out of breath, that you're down to only having three energy tokens for the rest of the day. On the other hand, if you've been, managed to be really savvy uh, with what you've done, maybe um, you haven't had a shower because after all you don't need a shower every day and it uses up additional energy. So you haven't had a shower and you've managed to uh, leave all your clothes right by your bed so there's no moving around too much when you uh, get dressed and you've actually sat on the edge of the bed to get dressed so you've sat down as opposed to stood up, stand, uh, you know you haven't got dressed standing up and that saved energy. So you might find that you've only used three tokens by lunchtime and you've got seven back and, and that would be uh, brilliant. Uh, but let's just say for uh, the sake of it that you've, that you've lost five. Now before we go on there is some good news to let you know and that's that by resting for a couple of hours you can generate an extra energy token. So let's say that uh, you manage to rest for a couple of hours before lunch and you've now got six energy tokens rather than five. So what are you going to do for the rest of the day? Well, let's say that you need to go shopping. So you're going to have to get in the car, that's going to take a little bit of energy, drive to the supermarket, and then you're going to have to walk around the supermarket, hopefully leaning on a trolley because that saves energy, but that's still going to be uh, take a lot of energy out of you. Then you'll have to take the heavy shopping back to the car, drive home, go inside, and then unpack. Unpack is always is, uh, is one of my least favourite activities uh, connected with shopping. And then after that you can't just completely relax because you've got to make tea, eat tea and then clear up. Do you know you could easily find that you have lost all your energy tokens and you're essentially you're running on empty. And you're still going to have to go upstairs and get ready for bed on nothing. This is a real drastic situation to get in. If you have lost all your energy tokens, you will feel completely wasted. And then the other key information is it's going to have a knock-on effect the next day. You're going to be more exhausted and fatigued the next day. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. So the take home messages uh, when using this energy token illustration is that people who have ongoing fatigue don't have an endless supply of energy tokens. They may have more energy one day compared to another and it will be useful to know that. So if you're a partner of somebody uh, with a lung condition, you might like to say to them in the morning, you know, uh, well, 
how many energy tokens have you got today? And if they say, oh, I think 12 or 14, you think, yes, this is a day when we can do more. We can push it a bit. But if they say, oh, do you know, I think I've only got eight today, then you know that you're going to have to be really careful and you're going to have to make uh, real allowances for the fact that they are uh, on low energy levels, even at the start of the day. The other thing to note is that it's really worthwhile saving your energy tokens and conserving energy. And then you'll have more to use for the things that you enjoy. So, for example, my mother, who's got a severe lung condition, uh, she'll come up and see the grandkids. She'll want to come and see them in some sort of drama show at school or something. She'll drive up in the morning and she'll deliberately just rest and do nothing in the afternoon because she's uh, generating some energy tokens. And then she'll hope that she feels uh, well enough with enough energy to come out in the evening. But you know, sometimes she has to cancel even though she's, she's tried to maximise her chances. And people say that if you just do too much on one day, you pay for it on the next few days. I think the key message though is whatever happens, just don't run out of energy tokens. And most people would say, make sure you've always got a spare energy token in your pocket just for emergencies. I think it was last year, um, after we'd um, talked about energy tokens at the Fab Group, the next week I was overhearing a conversation between people and uh, this gentleman said, oh, it's awful. I just ran completely out of energy tokens. He said, I just couldn't cope. I, I didn't even know if I was going to get back home. And I thought, yes. Uh, and the, the, the lady who he was talking to was nodding. She understood it. It's a, it's a very good way of looking at fatigue and energy. So now we're going to come on to uh, thinking about energy conservation throughout the day. Uh, we're going to think about what uses a lot of energy. Uh, we're going to ask, is there a way to do it differently to save energy? Or do you really need to do it at all? And we're going to sort of look at a sort of standard routine day and look at ways that you can save energy. So I guess let's start by getting out of bed and getting dressed. And the key thing is to do it steadily in stages and not to rush. Um, so you can have breaks halfway through where you just sit and relax before uh, getting dressed completely. You might want to leave your dressing gown or your slippers or your underwear and other clothes right by your bed so you're not having to get out and reach and stretch for them because we know that uses up more energy. As I've already mentioned, sitting down on the edge of the bed to get dressed can be very helpful. And uh, compared to standing, sitting uses 25% less energy, so it's really worthwhile sitting when you can. Also, avoid bending down and reaching up. Um, it might be worthwhile thinking about having slip-on shoes as opposed to uh, lace-ups so that you don't have to bend down to tie your laces. You might like to use a long shoehorn to help get your shoes on. When you're washing in the bathroom, um, it's quite exhausting standing up at the sink for any length of time and you might want to use a perching stool. We'll come on to perching stools a bit later. Um, I'll show you some pictures of them. Um, the other thing is showering can be exhausting and you might want to consider sitting down in the shower. There's a, there are a number of shower chairs and shower stools that you might like uh, to use. If you use oxygen, definitely use the oxygen in the shower. Lots of people don't because they don't think that you should use any electrical equipment in the bathroom. And I can understand that, but having your oxygen piping coming into the bathroom and over, over the shower cubicle is absolutely fine. The tubing itself can get wet, there's no problem. Most people say that the most exhausting bit about having a shower is getting dry afterwards. So lots of people don't bother. They just wrap themselves in a terry toweling robe. They don't rub themselves dry with a towel. They just wrap themselves up and just wait until they dry naturally. People also say that just going to the toilet is exhausting. Walking across a room, getting to the toilet, doing your business um, is um, 
is exhausting and we'll come on to aids that can help on the loo um, later but you know it particularly if you're a man you might want to just consider using a pee bottle uh, you could keep it just on the floor by the sofa and then all you need to do when you want to wee is sort of stand up and just go for it uh, these pee bottles have got a cap on so they're completely closed there's no smell in the room and as you probably know urine is sterile it's not dangerous um, it, it doesn't matter having it around and it's very easy to just empty it down the loo uh, later and just wash out the container with um, uh, some washing up liquid you don't even need bleach Meal times can be exhausting for people, just preparing the meal. Um, so you want to prepare simple meals. You could consider having microwave uh, ready meals or freezer food. Uh, filling up a kettle can be exhausting, particularly lifting the full kettle back from the sink to its place on the kitchen surface. And people have found that uh, if they use a jug, they can just fill the water up um, from the tap and then fill the, the kettle using the jug and that saves energy. Sometimes people find that eating a large meal is exhausting and so if you're wanting to keep your energy up just eat small meals more often. And again don't forget to use oxygen when you're eating if you're on it. And it's definitely recommended that you wait at least half an hour after a meal before doing sort of physical activity. When I was little, uh, we used to go swimming in the afternoon at a local pool uh, quite frequently and my mum would never let us go until an hour after our lunch because she didn't want us to develop any stomach cramps um, as a result of all the blood uh, going to the stomach to try and digest the food and not being available elsewhere um, in the body um, for the muscles. When uh, shopping, you might want to consider not uh, filling your grocery bags completely, but just half full because it's so much easier then to lift them into the car. You might want to avoid going at rush hour when the shops and the streets are crowded. And you might even decide you don't want to go in person at all, but start using an online delivery service. That would certainly save a lot of energy. You'd then have your energy tokens available for some fun things. As we've mentioned before, bending down is not a good idea because it takes a lot of energy. And sometimes you can raise your washing machine or your tumble dryer to a sort of um, uh, shelf height um, so that you don't have to bend down. And that's something well worth uh, thinking about. When vacuuming, you can use the put, uh, you can regulate your breath to the vacuuming. We'll come on to that in a little bit, uh, and you'll find that actually a bit like pacing when walking, uh, that will help uh, save energy. You might want to avoid using aerosol cleaning products because they can irritate the lungs and the airways. And if you're a keen gardener, then you might want to alter the way you garden so you're not bending down the whole time. Maybe you can sit down and use a long handled trowel or hoe. Um, or you might want to switch to uh, looking after raised flower beds um, or some flowers uh, on the window uh, because that will be easier to get to, less energy involved. And I just want to mention here again that if you are doing an activity that's going to cause breathlessness, then do think about using some Oromorph liquid before the activity just to ease the breathlessness. It's not strictly to do with energy conservation. I'm not really quite sure why I've put it in here, but I think it's important to mention. So the next thing we're going to think about is optimising your breathing pattern and uh, connecting your breathing with your activity. Sounds a bit complicated and it is slightly complicated but once you get the hang of it it's very useful and it saves energy. There's two techniques here that we're going to discuss. One is called blow as you go and one is paced breathing. Blow as you go is a technique that you use when you're doing something that requires a lot of energy, such as lifting up a heavy bag or reaching to the top cupboard to take out um, something from up there. 
The idea is you breathe in before doing the action and then you breathe out when you do the action. And of course, if you've got COPD or asthma, it can be quite useful to use the pursed lips uh, technique as you breathe out. So this uh, person, I can't work out if it's a woman or a man. Nope, still can't work out. Um, is uh, going to lift this heavy box. So what you can do is inhale first before the activity through your nose. And then you can bend down. And then whilst you, when you pick the object up, you're exhaling through pursed lips. You don't have to do the breathing in when you're standing up. You could do the breathing in when you're crouched down on the floor before pulling the box up and lifting the box up and breathing out as you do so. Do you know weightlifters use this exact same technique? So this lady here, as she prepares, she bends her knees and she breathes in. And then as she pushes the weight up above her head, she breathes out as she does that action. So this is the blow as you go technique or the breathe out as you push out technique. Now it's exactly the same process if you're putting an object down. You first of all inhale through your nose and then you gently bend your knees and let the box go to the floor uh, in a controlled manner and as you as you bend and let the box go down you breathe out. So this blow as you go is all about breathing in before you start an activity and breathing out when you're doing the activity. That's blow as you go. You can use blow as you go for other, um, in other instances, such as if you're stretching up to reach something out of a top cupboard in the kitchen, or if you're in bed and you're reaching over to turn off your alarm clock, or if you're bending down, maybe to tie your shoelace or to uh, put your shoe on, you breathe in before you do it, and then as you bend down, you breathe out. You can also use the technique as you step up, as you go into the house perhaps, you need to step up. So before stepping up, you breathe out. Sorry, before stepping up, you breathe in. And then as you step up, you breathe out. Really, you're doing the breathe out bit during the most difficult part of any action. You're blowing out as you do the action. The other... Um, technique where you connect your breath to the activity is uh, paced steps, paced breathing. And you can use this particularly when going upstairs or when walking. And I actually use this technique uh, when I'm in the mountains uh, going up somewhere. It's a long way, it's really steep, and I actually connect my breathing to my walking just uh, as is recommended here. I didn't realise um, that it was a particular technique that I did, but I now realise that I, I use it. So, when you're climbing the stairs, there are a number of different ways you can uh, connect your breathing in. You could, just on every step up, breathe out and blow out. And that would be really doing the blow as you go technique on the stairs. That would be if you were going up the stairs really slowly. So one step up and as you lift your leg up, you blow out. You rest, you breathe in. As you lift your leg up, you breathe out, blow as you go. But you might actually be able to get up the stairs a bit quicker and then you might want to breathe in when you go up one step and breathe out when you lift the other leg up and go up the next step. Breathe in as you go up one step and out as you go up the next step. Or alternatively, you might want to breathe in for one step and out and out for two steps. Breathe in for one step and out and out for two steps. Uh, remembering that if you're going to uh, do any, any in or out breath for longer, you want to make the out breath longer so that you um, slow the breathing down and so that you breathe out fully. The key thing is to make sure you don't rush up those stairs and you want to keep the pace at a constant speed the whole time. 
You can also use paced breathing when walking and uh, essentially you're timing your breath to your steps as before and you can even sort of hum to yourself or sing to yourself like a sort of slow march. You can sort of breathe in for two steps and breathe out for another two steps. So it's in, out, in, out as as you walk. And of course it might not be right to do two uh, steps in, two steps out. Uh, you'll just have to adapt and work out what feels best for you. So the example here, I've got footsteps here on the left hand side, <coughs> is that for the first two steps you breathe in and for the second two steps you breathe out. So it's in, out, in, out as you walk. But as I say, that might not be right for you and it might be better to step up, do one step in and two steps out. So it would be in, out, out, in, out, out. Uh, just work out what's best, but definitely connecting your breathing and your breath to your pacing is definitely worthwhile. I think what it does mainly is it uh, forces you to keep your breath steady and not race. And by not getting this rapid shallow breathing, you're ensuring that your breath is efficient and effective and that you're uh, conserving energy. Always keep to a steady, regular rhythm. OK, we come on to another section now, and this is all about household helps and aids uh, to help you uh, save energy whilst doing things around the house. And the first item I want to mention to you is the perching stool. Um, this is a stool uh, that um, you're not really sitting down on and you're not standing up. It's halfway between the two. You're perching and uh, you enable yourself to perch because the seat is not completely flat. It's at a slight angle. The back legs are longer than the front legs, so that just sort of tilts the stool slightly. And as we've said before, if you're standing up, you use more energy than if you're sitting down. And when you sit down, you use up 25% less energy. So it's well worth sitting down. But if you're uh, in the kitchen chopping vegetables or doing the washing up, um, you're unable to just sit down at a proper normal chair because it's just at the wrong level and you'd have to have your hands too high up. It would be exhausting. And similarly, in the bathroom, um, uh, it's your, your, the sinks are normally too high to use a normal chair. So this is where perching stools come in uh, and are really helpful. You can see the lady on the left hand side of this picture here in a very nice, uh, very modern kitchen there using a perching stool. Uh, whilst um, on her computer. Uh, the lady in the middle there, an older lady, seems to be chopping something in her kitchen using a perching stool. And the perching stool in the bottom right hand picture, do you know, I don't think the lady has the stool high enough. I think it's too low for her body and the work surface and I think she's having to lift her arms up to do whatever task she's doing at that work surface. So it might be a very nice photo but I don't think it's actually um, appropriate from a function point of view. Um, the picture on the right hand side shows a lady uh, having a wash at the sink um, and that uh, that's a really good example of using a perching stool in the bathroom. You can see her bathroom's not exactly big but she's still able to get that perching stool in. Now we've talked about shower chairs and mentioned, we've mentioned shower chairs and shower stools before. Um, there's a number of varieties. Uh, these things are available on the NHS, but clearly there's a, a much wider range if you're going to buy something yourself. But if you sit down to have a shower, you're going to be able to relax. You're going to be able to enjoy it more because you're in less of a rush to get out. It might increase your um, electricity bill slightly or your gas bill, depending on um, what sort of shower you have. But I think it would be well worthwhile for your quality of life to have a stool or a chair in the shower. I mentioned before that there are aids that you can use uh, on, on around the toilet that help save energy. Um, 
I don't know if you've ever sat down on a low settee and then tried to get up again, but it is exhausting getting up from such a low level. And um, although uh, the toilet seat isn't at a real low level, it is still relatively low. And you can save energy by raising the toilet seat so you don't have to sit down so far and you don't have to stand up so uh, far either. And that will just mean that you're having to use less muscle power and less energy tokens when you go to the loo. There are a number of different ways you can raise the toilet seat as you can see there. Now, you might think these look awful and no way would you ever have one of these in your house. But... Um, you might as well try it and if it doesn't make that much difference for you then you can just you know ask the people to take it away again um, and if it makes a difference then then I would suggest you go for it um, my mother-in-law um, got one of these a, a few years ago and the first time I saw it in her bathroom I just thought "Ooh, golly uh, but it didn't feel odd to use at all and uh, very hygienic absolutely fine the other thing that you can see around the toilet in two of the pictures are rails and these are another way of reducing and um, sharing out the energy required to stand up because you can press down with your hands on the rails and that will help you stand up without getting too breathless. Um, now there are different walking aids to help you walk further and walk with more ease and I know that people uh, tend to not really like to use these at all. Uh, they, it's quite a big step isn't it to actually be seen out and about with a walking aid. But um, often at these fab groups one person has got a walking aid like this and they bring it into the room and when we're having a tea break other people uh, try it out just round the um, room or down the corridor and it is very common for people to say golly this makes a massive difference doesn't it that's just amazing wow I like this because they're not heavy and they just um, they get you into a position that's very efficient for breathing and the fact that you can lean on them also just takes oh, um, just just conserves energy I think they're particularly useful, the one that has a little seat on it, that one on the right is particularly useful because if you're uh, walking down a road or you're in a, um, um, a shopping mall or a shopping centre um, and you, or you need to get from A to B, um, if there was nowhere to sit down you might really hurry to get to A to B because you just want to get it over and done with and uh, you know you know it's not going to feel pleasant doing this amount of exercise. But if you've got one of these uh, walking aids, these relators, then halfway along you can just put the brakes on and stop. And um, you can then turn round and sit down on that sort of cushioned bit there and your back can lean against that um, foam covered bar and you can just sit there and relax for a bit and just catch your breath. And this is so much better for energy conservation than getting into a state where you're gasping for your breath. Now these devices look quite good, but um, if you're willing to pay extra, these aren't these ones, uh, the drive ones, I don't think are available on the NHS. There's some really superb models that um, uh, I always like to have a go of if somebody t uh, turns up with one of these. They're just, uh, they must be German, surely. Um, uh, I, I think they're brilliant. So, if you're interested in trying out any of these household helps or these aids to walk, uh, then um, they're available on the NHS from occupational therapists. And if you're in Derbyshire, one of the easiest ways of contacting an occupational therapist is to get in contact with the care coordinator at your GP surgery. These are people who coordinate care. So, um, if the doctors or nurses wanted somebody to be referred to an occupational therapist they would ask the care coordinator to sort that out if somebody needed uh, meals on wheels or a carer coming in each day to help get them dressed then it would be the care coordinator person at the GP surgery who organizes it and you can go you can phone up and you can talk to the care coordinator directly yourself you don't have to have your GP refer you in um, so it's a good way of getting access to care. 
Now the next thing we're going to discuss is the boom and bust cycle and this is another way at looking at fatigue and energy levels and I don't know whether you will prefer this boom and bust cycle or whether you prefer the energy token illustration. That would be interesting to know. So this is a sort of graph and along the bottom there uh, time goes on. So we've got morning uh, in that left hand bit and then the evening further over and the idea is this graph is going to represent how much energy you're using throughout the day. If you're just relaxing and sitting in a chair for several hours then uh, you'll be in that low yellow band there not using hardly any energy at all. Whereas if you're moving from room to room slowly, just doing odd jobs, taking it, taking your time, pacing yourself, going very slowly, then you're going to be in the pacing zone, that green area. But if you really need to get something done and it's quite an uh, active job and you're pushing it a little bit, then you're going to be in that top uh, yellow area there. So maybe you might say that staying in the pacing zone is, is a good place to be because you're doing a bit of activity, you're keeping your muscles um, in trim, but you're, you're not overdoing it too much. But being realistic, that's not what you're going to do the whole day. You're going to be in the pacing zone for a bit and then you're going to need to do something where you need to push it. Um, you might just push it again a little bit and then you might drop down to having a few hours of relaxation before going back into the pacing uh, zone. And that's just fully uh, appropriate and fine. What you want to avoid is doing the boom and bust. That is pushing it, pushing yourself so much that you get really exhausted, really breathless, fatigued, so fatigued that you come crashing down to the bust zone and can't do anything else for ages. It may be that you even don't get out of the bust zone that day. Um, but it's, there's even more reason why you should avoid doing this boom and bust. And that's because it's got more severe consequences than just for the next few hours. You see, sometimes, particularly if you've boom and busted quite a bit, you'll find that your energy levels are reset. So then uh, what would normally be uh, just a gentle uh, pacing activity going from room to room suddenly feels more exhausting and uh, as if you're pushing it more and basically you've just lost your ability to do things and it's a result of the body getting damaged by going through the boom and bust cycle too much. So do be aware, try and avoid doing the boom and bust because it can be detrimental to your long-term health. Now, whenever you talk about energy conservation, uh, most um, health professionals will tell you about the five Ps. So I feel we have to cover the five Ps, otherwise we won't have done it properly. If we talk about fatigue and energy conservation, we have to talk about the five Ps. So the first P of saving energy is prioritising. Realising that you're not going to be able to do everything, so just leave out things that are less important and aren't enjoyable. You might want to ask yourself, does this really need doing today? Or you might ask, do I really uh, need to do this at all. Um, people sometimes used to dust the uh, living room every day and that really isn't necessary at all, isn't it? I would say that it's not even necessary to dust once a week, but um, I am uh, rather relaxed in my um, household uh, tasks and tidiness. The second P of energy conservation is planning, and I think this is a really big one. You want to make sure when you're looking at the day or looking at the week that you're not planning to do too much at, in any time period. If there's a really big job to do, like um, cleaning out the garage or um, uh, cleaning the bedroom uh, cupboards all out, you might want to break the job down into smaller tasks and spread the tasks out over a day or a week with lots of rest and gaps and relaxation between. You definitely want to avoid doing too much in one day. And then you might find that you've got more energy uh, at one part of the day versus another part of the day. You might have more energy early on in the day, for example, 
and it would make sense then to plan any heavy work uh, when you're most likely to have good energy levels. So think ahead and work out if there's an easier way of doing the activity. If you're doing something like potting plants or baking a cake, then it's worthwhile getting all the ingredients or the materials that you need together um, uh, at the start. And it's also worthwhile just making sure that if you're reaching up to get the flour out, you get the baking powder out at the same time so that you're not having to do extra trips and uh, waste energy that way. It's important to make sure that the activities that you plan for the day aren't all routine chores. You want to do some fun things. And you need to be nice to yourself. If you don't get the jobs done that you thought you'd get done, well, don't worry. I mean, who does? It's also worth planning to make sure that you have a good night's sleep each day because, as you will recall, um, poor sleep or poor nutrition can worsen fatigue. The third P of energy conservation is pacing. Do you remember those energy tokens? You automatically lose three if you rush and get gasping for breath. Remember the boom and bust. If you uh, push it too much, you're going to just exhaust yourself for quite a long time afterwards and you may even uh, damage yourself long term. So take it easy. Don't rush. Try not to get frustrated that these jobs are taking longer than they used to. And make sure you remember to control your breathing. Make it slow and steady. Use the blow as you go technique and the paced breathing walking techniques. And make sure you take regular breaks. But particularly important, take the break before you really feel as if you need it, before you're tired. Make sure you listen to your body. The fourth P is about position and I think the main one is remembering that sitting down to do something saves energy compared to standing up. We've also mentioned before that bending down and reaching up is not a good idea. It's, it takes a lot of energy. If you're going to have to do that, make sure that you blow as you go, you breathe out as you do that action. And then the last P of energy conservation is problem solving. It may be that you can actually get rid of the job completely. Maybe you can get a cleaner or uh, maybe some of your family can help. Or maybe you can do the shopping online or sort the job out over the phone rather than go in person. So the five P's of energy conservation. Prioritise. Just do the important things. Don't worry about uh, the things that are less important, maybe. Plan your day and plan the activities carefully. Make sure you pace yourself. Think about the position that you're in when you're doing the activity to save energy. And see if you can problem solve and maybe get rid of a few jobs onto somebody else. Well, we're going to change the topic completely now uh, and move on to talking about relaxation and mindfulness. I don't know whether me just mentioning this uh, freaks you out and you think, good grief, this is a bit touchy-feely, it's, it's not for me, no way, thank you, uh, or whether you've had any experience in relaxation and mindfulness. I must say I haven't had that much experience um, in particular techniques until the last few years when I, uh, from my reading, I realised that it was very important to people with a, a, a severe lung condition to make sure they get regular relaxation in. Um, and I started becoming more interested in the area and realised that there's a lot of research showing how effective mindfulness is. So, uh, just a few notes here. Uh, I don't think relaxation comes easy to most of us. It certainly doesn't come easy to me. I've got a job list and I want to get on and do things. Um, and stopping and being still and relaxing is quite hard sometimes. And trying to switch off my brain from thinking about the next thing to do is hard. But there's a lot of evidence that the more you practice relaxation, the easier it gets. 
And what most uh, experts advise is that you allocate a little bit of time, at least once a day or twice a day, to practice some sort of relaxation. Now everyone's different and you'll find that some relaxation techniques are more effective for you than others and you just have to sort of uh, have a have a try out really. Mindfulness is a particular type of relaxation which is meant to be more effective on um, calming the body, reducing fatigue and enabling you to uh, really connect in the moment. Um, in mindfulness, you uh, deliberately pay attention to the present moment, to your own thoughts and feelings and to the world around you. You try and stop thinking about anything else and just focus on what's happening that very moment. Now, most of us are not used to doing that at all and um, it takes a lot of practice. But as I say, there's a lot of evidence that shows that mindfulness improves your mental well-being and can actually improve your physical condition, your lung disease as well. Um, I'll talk more about that next week. Um, I hope next week you'll be convinced that doing some of this sort of thinking and feeling relaxation bit uh, could be really effective for you. So mindfulness... Uh, often involves reconnecting with our bodies and the sensations that they experience. So we might um, look at things and focus on what we can see or what we can smell or hear. Uh, but another type of mindfulness also involves us being aware of our thoughts and our feelings right as they happen and not reacting to them but just noticing them. And as if we're standing back and watching from afar and of course we're normally just used to reacting to whatever we're thinking or feeling instantly but by doing mindfulness uh, we realize that actually our thoughts don't have to control us part of mindfulness is often just sitting still and not moving and so you might have an itch on your nose uh, for example and normally you just scratch it to relieve the itch but when you're doing mindfulness you might actually decide not to you might decide just to stay where you are and just let the itch be. And gradually the sensation of itchiness will go and you'll realise that you don't have to react to every single thing your brain is telling you. There's a lot of information about mindfulness online. Um, there's a professor in Oxford, Mark Williams, who has done a lot of research on mindfulness and is, is, is very good. And he's got a little introduction to mindfulness. It's not very long on YouTube. And the NHS site on mindfulness is also very good. I'm just going to take you through... Um, four different mindfulness exercises here that you might like to try and incorporate in your day um, and uh, the first one is notice five things you can do this anytime and it's particularly useful to do if you feel like you're getting stressed or panicky or you're really breathless because it will give you something else to focus on and to think about um, but i think it's going to be difficult to do it um, just instantly when you're stressed or out of breath or something it would be much better to practice it when you're relaxed and to get into the groove and uh, to become accustomed to doing it when you're relaxed and then it'll be easier to do in a stressful situation. So in this exercise you just stop what you're doing and you take five deep slow breaths in and out and you focus on each breath as it enters the body and it leaves the body. Now this technique isn't uh, deliberately for people who have got a lung condition and it might be that actually focusing on your breath and taking five deep breaths is not the right thing for you so you might want to just skip that uh, a step if you want I just don't know but I'm just saying you know do what feels right for you. But the main thing, once you've got into a, just a calmer space, perhaps by breathing, is to look around and notice five things that you can see. Now, you could just notice the mug of coffee, the TV, the cabinet, 
the armchair, things like that that are very obvious. Or you might want to try and notice things that are just slightly more unusual. You might want to notice uh, the, 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 the leaves on the tree just fluttering in the wind outside. You might notice uh, the light playing, uh, making different patterns on the surface on the table. You might look at the carpet and the, the patterns in the carpet and notice the swirls. You might look at your trouser material and uh, look at the detail of the stitching. When you've looked and been particularly focused on five things that you can see, next you can shut your eyes and notice five things that you can hear. You might want to do it now. What can you hear around you? Perhaps you can hear birds outside or children playing. Maybe you can hear the boiler or the uh, washing machine on. Or a clock ticking. After you've noticed five things that you can hear, you next keep your eyes shut and notice five things that you can feel your body in contact with. The first one is probably pretty easy and obvious. You're sitting on a chair or something and you can feel your bottom and your back legs on the chair. Maybe you can feel your feet on the floor. You might have to work harder to notice other things that the body is in contact with. Maybe there's a hair on your face or the material of your collar against your neck. Maybe you can feel your wristwatch. And then when you've finished noticing the five things that your body is in contact with, then you can take another five deep breaths in and out and, and then uh, gently come back to the real world. I don't know whether you sort of tried to do that a little bit with me just then. I don't know whether you're feeling slightly calmer and more relaxed. Uh, the more you do these mindfulness techniques, the more benefit you're going to get from them. And as I say, to be able to do that and just switch off for a bit and focus deliberately on the present moment in a time of crisis or stress can be really helpful. Another technique that you can use is called the daily routine technique. And you take any morning daily routine, such as brushing your teeth or having a shower, um, and whilst you're doing it, just for those five minutes, ten minutes, two minutes, you pay full attention to how your body's feeling and what your senses are telling you. You try not to uh, think about what you're going to need to do later on in the day and the stresses and the struggles that might happen and the situations that you're going to need to deal with. You just switch off and focus fully on what's happening to you and your body at that point. So let's say you are in the shower and uh, you're under the water and uh, you're noticing the water coming out of the spout and um, just jumping off your arm. You're noticing the water swirling round into the plug hole. What can you smell? You can smell the soap, a nice clean smell. What can you hear? Well, I would imagine probably the water. I'm not sure whether you'd be able to hear anything else. What can you feel? Well, probably the soap, the silky soft soap against your skin. So you can focus in and get better and better at concentrating on what's happening in your body. If you want as well, you can focus on what's happening in your mind, what your thoughts are. That 
is more dangerous in a way because as soon as you start thinking of your thoughts it will just propel you to what's happening for the rest of the day. But the idea if you do uh, start to do this mindfulness on thoughts is that you just notice your thoughts and you let them go again. You just notice them and let them go. And the idea is by having this short time of mindfulness you're just relaxing the body and you're focusing on the moment. Another technique for mindfulness is the body scan and uh, you normally do this lying down or lying back with your feet up and the idea is to relax and focus on every bit of your body in turn starting at your toes normally and just working your way up your legs ending up at your head and you notice how your toes are feeling whether there's any uh, tension in them or uh, whether there's any warmth in them whether they're, they're touching any surface whether there's any pain and you just notice it but don't react to it um, and uh, if you want to try a body scan, Mark Williams, this professor chap from Oxford, does a very good uh, body scan. It's available on a CD that he does, but you can just uh, listen to it on YouTube uh, by typing into a uh, search engine, mindfulness body scan, Mark Williams YouTube, and it'll come up with a little sort of green picture like that. There are a lot of books on... Um, uh, mindfulness, lots of CDs and books that if, if you get into it. Now this last mindfulness exercise is, um, I'm not sure if it really is mindfulness, maybe somebody can tell me, uh, but it's one of my personal favourite things to do and it's visualising your own personal calm space. So um, uh, when I'm stressed and I've got a lot to do and I just feel like I'm rushing from one thing to another, sometimes I just take a few moments sitting at my computer or sitting in the car before getting out uh, for the next appointment to just relax and I, I disappear into my personal calm space. Some people call it a happy space but I think it's better to have a calm space and uh, it's the equivalent of just... Uh, disappearing to Greece or on a cruise ship or something like that, getting away from it all. So what you want to do before you start is decide, work out what, what your personal calm space is. It has to be somewhere that represents peace and relaxation for you. Somewhere that's special and sort of unique to you because of your memories. Um, we very much recommend that it's outside, not in your house, so you can't just think about being in your bed, for example. It's got to be somewhere that you've been outside. Some people say you can choose somewhere from your imagination, but I think it works better if you've got a real connection with it, because then this amygdala, do you remember that bit of the brain that uh, recalls strong memories, will help you get into that place and be absorbed in your memory of that place. So it could be part of a walk in the countryside, it could be uh, at a beach, in the mountains, by a lake, in a garden. It needs to be somewhere where you feel, uh, where you felt happy and secure with no bad or sad memories. So for me, it's um, I, I disappear to a garden in Pembrokeshire um, and um, I was there on holiday with my family a number of years ago. Uh, it was a lovely day, it wasn't too hot, too cold, the sun was shining um, and we just stopped by this lake and I just lay down. The kids were happily playing, not making too much noise, uh, just um, a little way away. Uh, my husband was sitting down next to me. I don't know what he was doing. He wasn't talking to me. Maybe he was um, looking at his phone. And I just, just relaxed. I looked up at the sky, which was blue with a few misty, with uh, wispy uh, clouds. Uh, the sun was shining through the green leaves, which were rustling. Everything felt fresh. There were a few sort of noises of birds and yeah, I think it was just birds. And the grass underneath me was very soft and cool. So 
What I tend to do when I'm in this situation is I close my eyes and I imagine I'm in this calm space. And you really just think how it felt, how what you could see, what you could smell, what the sensations and the sounds were like there. And you just try and forget about everything else and just let yourself be absorbed uh, and just focus on this place. You just stay there and relax. You can, if you want, whilst you're there, notice how your body's feeling. Are there any warm sensations in your body? You don't want to hurry. You want to just stay there and relax. And then when you just feel you're ready, you gently open your eyes and get on with the day again. As I say, that's one of my favourite um, uh, exercises to do. Now, as we've said before, mindfulness needs to be practiced before you really gain much benefit. It's going to feel a bit awkward and weird at first, but there's so much evidence that it positively impacts on people's well-being, particularly people with long-term conditions such as lung disease, that I really think it's worthwhile going for. There are, of course, other methods of relaxation. You might just want to focus on your breathing, or you might not. Um, often relaxation techniques focus on breathing, but as I've said before, I'm really not sure whether that's good for somebody with a breathing problem or not. Alternatively, you might want to just relax back and listen to a calming piece of music. You might find it really relaxing to just soak in a warm bath. Or connect with nature, particularly green nature. Do you know they've done um, uh, studies and they've worked out that just sitting, looking at a computer screen that's got a lovely outdoor landscape picture with plenty of green in it, the colour green, actually calms you down and de-stresses you. They've looked at the sympathetic nervous system, which is the nerves that uh, are to do with stress, and the parasympathetic nervous system which is the opposite and they found that looking at the colour green stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's well worth just looking out at the garden and the greenery if you want to relax. Another idea that sounds a bit weird at first is to <coughs> start a gratitude journal. <coughs> This is um, where you can record each day three things that you're grateful for. Uh, it might sound a bit weird, but what you're doing is you're sort of counteracting the uh, thoughts and feelings of difficulty that you experience throughout the day with thoughts and feelings of things that are good. Now, you might find it very easy to just write down three things that you're thankful for and grateful for. Uh, you know, um, I'm thankful for my daughter. I'm thankful that I've got a house. I'm thankful that I've got enough money for food. And you could just make them as simple as that. But uh, bit by bit, you'll probably want to be um, more deliberate and focus on small things in the day that you're thankful for. So you might write down... Uh, I had a caramel ice cream this afternoon. It just tasted brilliant. Or you might say, the lady in the shop was just so helpful um, uh, packing the stuff up again when the bag fell to pieces. Uh, I'm just so grateful to her. Something like that. So they're small little, more unique, more personal instances that you can be thankful for. Um, you may find it more difficult to write three things in your gratitude diary when you're having a bit of a difficult time. But in actual fact, that's just the sort of time when it would be a good idea to open it and to, in a way, force yourself to write something down. And, uh, of course, you'd then be looking back at the pages as well with all the other things that you can be thankful for. It can just help you get out of a bit of a rut. Another idea that uh, lots of people find very relaxing is massage. Uh, you could have a back rub or a hand or a foot massage off somebody if you've got somebody that you have access to. Some people even pay for a full body massage each week because they know that this is some a, a time that de-stresses them and just sets them up uh, to do better for the whole week. And then there are 
a, a wide variety of relaxation apps that you can get on your phone or on the internet. There's just so many, it's um, just uh, difficult to know what is good. Whatever you do, whether you do those specific mindfulness techniques or whether you use some other sort of relaxation, make sure that you do plan in relaxation, not just resting in a chair doing things, but relaxation in your day. It's going to be worthwhile to you. So that's the end of this um, uh, second Fab Week, on mainly on fatigue, but a bit on relaxation and mindfulness as well. Don't forget about the Lung Line. If you've got any queries, you're very welcome to contact us. And next week, we've got our final Fab Week, and it's Living Life to the Max.